Hello and welcome to the second episode in our Digital Engineering Thought Leaders series. In this series, we'll host subject matter experts from the industry to share actionable insights into key topics such as digital engineering, BIM, ISO 19650, and common data environments. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Connie Butler and I'm the Digital Engineering Specialist here at 12D Synergy. And for today's session, I'll also be your moderator. This thought leadership series is aimed at all professionals involved in the delivery and operation of built assets. This could include clients and government, asset owners and operators, as well as consultants and contractors. In this episode, we are extremely pleased to be hosting Christina Sabian. Christina is the founder of BeWise, which is an international consultancy focused on driving technology adoption in the construction and property industries. She is a key voice internationally for the adoption of digital twins for built assets. Having authored papers on digital twins with both the Institute of Engineering and Technology and the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. In this session, Christina will give an overview of the digital twin landscape in ANZ and internationally. She will explain digital twins and the impact on the day-to-day -day life of the professionals working across the asset life cycle, as well as sharing some practical insights into the lessons learned from their implementation. If you have any questions for Christina throughout this presentation, you can submit your questions as shown on screen. We'll be hosting a live Q&A session at the end of this, and we hope that Christina will get to your questions then. Well, that's enough from me. I'll hand you over to Christina. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's session uh, to discuss one of the most talked about topics in our industry, yet what I often like to refer to as the elephant in the room. Let's talk about digital twins. This is the agenda for today. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of the digital twin landscape, uh, the impact of digital twins in your day-to-day -day life, give you some practical insights into the implementation of digital twins um, across the design and construction um, phases, and uh, some of the lessons learned from the failures of implementing digital twins. But before taking you through this digital twin journey, let's take a moment to introduce myself. If you're still wondering where my accent is from, um, I was born and raised in Italy in a town called Turin in the northwest of the country. I started my career qualifying as a building and land surveyor in 1998. Um, I mostly work in civil engineering projects uh, for my local uh, government in my hometown. And in 2005, I moved to London, uh, where I continued my career at Greenwich Council in transport operations. After working for the London 2012 Olympics, uh, managing uh, the transport operation for Greenwich uh, Park Equestrian Venue, I was uh, headhunted by Autodesk uh, as a geospatial specialist for their civil infrastructure solution for North Europe. In the last 20 years, I also gained a considerable amount of qualifications, uh, including three academic degrees, um, in environmental economics, civil engineering, and um, an executive MBA from the University of Cambridge. And for the last four years, I've been running my own company, BeWise, a management consultancy with offices in London and now Melbourne, Australia, working with a lot of startups and SMEs and help them to bring uh, their technology solution to the construction market. However, Digital Twins Management Consultancy Services are now my main line of business. Um, I'm currently recognized as uh, one of the industry experts on this topic. I'm a renowned speaker at industry events around the, globe, the world, and uh, we'll be chairing uh, the biggest conference on uh, this topic in uh, the Southern Hemisphere um, the, at the Digital uh, World Build Summit. Uh, taking place in Sydney on the 23rd and 24th um, of May. I sit on uh, many industry panels and uh, in Australia I'm part of the ABAP as a management uh, technical working group as well as been, uh, I've been lecturing at the University of Melbourne for the last three years uh, to undergraduate and postgraduate students enrolled in architecture and construction management courses, sharing my knowledge and understanding of implementing digital twins for our built assets. 
My consulting engagement these days span across the world uh, with a lot of work in Europe and especially in the Middle East. Um, and these are just some of the small, you know, the companies that I've been working uh, with for the last three years, which are not under NDA. <laughs> Um, I often like to summarize the digital twin landscape as a circus um, and I'm, I'm a very passionate and vocal um, advocate in our industry and one of the many things I do is I run a column on acbusiness.com where I write about my experience in this digital twin world. Um, I published an article called The Elephant in the Circus at the end of last year which inspired this lecture. Uh, so you might want to um, have a, it's a very nice uh, read. So now, uh, let's start with some basic concepts. Um, I'm sure you've researched this topic and you might have Googled uh, the term. Um, well, I found this image on Twitter last year, which I think summarizes very well the confusion that there is around uh, this terminology. Let's be straightforward with this. Um, um, it's, it's a very confusing market and there is no other way to explain this. Um, only a few years ago, um, you can now find some decent publication discussing the adoption of digital twins, you know, and this concept to our big assets. And I still remember when I had to start writing the first publication on this topic, um, published then like by the IET um, three years ago. Now there are hundreds of academic paper, literature, and what I like to call a ridiculous amount of nonsense marketing material to sell you um, the latest digital twin solution and services. And um, hopefully at the end of this lecture, uh, you've been a bit more uh, clarity on this topic and what it means to you. For anyone who is uh, new uh, to this digital twin concept, let's give a bit more uh, history on that terminology. Um, it was Michael Grip, a professor at the University of Michigan, that in 2003, during his course on, pub, on product lifecycle management, probably the first person who formally introduced uh, the digital twin um, you know, terminology, and um, he described it as a virtual digital equivalent to a physical product with three main prerequisites. The real space, the virtual space in the connection of data and information that tie the virtual and real space together. As you can see, it's a concept that was born in the manufacturing industry and it's certainly struggling to adapt to the fragmented and very long construction life cycle. And uh, currently there is no unified definition of what a digital twin is for our industry. And you will soon realize it means a lot of different, different things um, to a lot of different people, depending on where you are at and where you are working in the life cycle. Let's talk about the digital twin landscape. Um, the term um, is currently used to describe a very large amount of outputs from 3D laser scans to 3D models to be models to sophisticated IoT dashboard to what I like call VIR unicorns across the entire construction life cycle and there is no real set guideline on what should be included or excluded. As mentioned there is no you know definition um, unified definition of these terms and what it means to the AC uh, world and perhaps who knows, maybe we will never agree on one. Another interesting fact is that the digital twin term is uh, certainly, you know, leverage as a marketing strategy. And you might have noticed that pretty much overnight, everyone is now describing their product and services as a digital twin. And it's multi-million dollars, you know, market. So, you know, it's not surprising that. One of the other facts I noticed is that, um, Asset owner buying habits are certainly shifting. Uh, new requ requirements are uh, to use the life cycle approach, digital twin approach, according to the ISO 19650, uh, is now features in many of the latest standards uh, that I came across. And uh, I'm sure you all know uh, what I'm talking about uh, because uh, perhaps you know you watched um, uh, the previous session in this series by my really good friend, you know Paul Chicock um, on ISO 1950. 
If you haven't, you might want to go and have a look now. But also one of the other interesting things I witnessed is uh, these new requirements um, to create digital twin uh, of, uh, for these new brownfield assets um, are now really uh, becoming common practice. But unfortunately, there is no specification on what this digital twin and what properties should be included or excluded and what business needs this digital twin um, actually addresses. So as I mentioned, it's, yes, definitely a very uh, confusing market. So many organizations around the world are trying to bring clarity and make sense of this market. And uh, this is just a selection of organizations I follow and they are very active in this space from the Center of Digital Big Britain in the UK to the Digital Twin Consortium in the US and to the very active Smart Cities Council uh, group here in Australia and New Zealand. If you want to know a bit more, uh, the Australasian um, BIM Advisory Board uh, published uh, a positioning paper early last year, uh, summarizing a lot of the work and initiative uh, in this space, uh, that one handed. Many governments are now embracing and mandating digital twins as a response to government policies on a diverse range of issues. The UK was probably the first I've seen um, embracing and uh, this opportunity with the launch of the Gemini principles over three years ago and uh, with the establishment of the Center of Digital Big Britain and the consequential launch of the National Digital Twin Programme with the goal of creating an ecosystem of connected digital twins to ensure a secure, resilient data sharing and effective information management of the entire UK infrastructure network. In Europe, the European Commission is investing heavily in an EU-wide framework for a digital building logbook. Uh, I was part of the initial research and uh, in uh, simple terms is a database of building related data to encourage data availability and transparency between the various stakeholders across the entire life cycle. In Middle East, digital twins are a very hot topic. I've just come back uh, from the Digital Twin Conference in Dubai. And uh, as I mentioned, I work a lot in the uh, region and then um, as there are, you know, currently not only cities, but entire countries being built. And uh, all the new tenders um, have uh, digital twins um, as the requirement for outputs, according to ISO 19650. And uh, here in Australia, you might have heard of the New South Wales Spatial Digital Twin and the Digital Twin for Sydney, but also of the over $35 million dollars currently spent to deliver the digital twin um, Victoria. Uh, certainly very ambitious project. So I, as you have seen, uh, this con the concept of digital twins has gained a uh, significant momentum in recent years and it's very unlikely that it's going to stop anytime soon. So what is the purpose of a digital twins for our built asset? The primary purpose is to use uh, the digital representation uh, to gain valuable insights to improve the operation and management of the built asset. In fact, you will find uh, that the majority of the literature addressing this topic is for the benefit of the OPEX space. But what does it mean for the early stage planning, detailed design and construction phases? So to shed some light on uh, these early stages last month, uh, we published this white paper with the Royal Institute of Charter Surveyors, giving some perspective uh, for professional and stakeholder working this early phase and phases of the construction life cycle. If you want to know a bit more and deep dive uh, on this topic, you can uh, use the QR code and download your copy. Um, in the chapter two, uh, there are a few graphics uh, and tools that you might find useful, uh, such as the one representing the functional elements of a digital twin, the virtual, the physical space, as well as the very important, you know, synchronization characteristics in terms of fidelity and frequency. Another useful resource 
is what does the system architecture of a digital twin look like and uh, you can find that too. Not all scenarios and use cases require complex system architecture, however, I must admit I've seen the reality of implementation and sometimes even very simple use cases, you know, end up with very complicated uh, system um, architecture. So digital twins are a data-driven process. And the vast majority of digital data is created, managed, and used throughout the asset lifecycle and is involving you know, multiple project team members and stakeholders. Exchanging uh, this very large amount and volume of digital data requires the use of a structured information management approach. Oh, well, and I think you all know what the process is called, yeah, and uh, certainly the building information, you know, um, modeling process can definitely, you know, become uh, very useful. So how does it work? Well, during the design phase uh, is when we collect a lot of the information um, that can be, you know, put together to create the digital representation of our, you know, built uh, asset. So it should be very simple uh, once, you know, the asset is built to create our digital twin, right? Well, it's not exactly that simple. So what is really happening now is that even when the BIM process is followed and the so-called BIM models uh, is created, then our uh, digital representation only really include for the majority only exclusive geometrical elements of the asset. Whereas in order to leverage the digital data across the entire life cycle and then in the OPEX phase for the purpose of creating, you know, these very useful uh, digital twins of our asset, we need rich metadata. They can be really easily be searched, queried, and turned into an insightful decision. So what is happening now is a huge breakdown from CAPEX to OPEX, devaluing significantly the value of the digit information that is currently you know, created and collected during the CAPEX phase. So there is already a lot of this digital data created, but it's either missing important elements or is not the right format or structured properly to be used or reused for the purpose of creating the digital twin. So, why is this is happening? Well, many reasons. Some are under our control, some other are difficult to tackle. And these are the legal framework, the industry practice, the lack of interdisciplinary collaboration, uh, the common language and interoperability. In the um, Rick's publication, uh, you can find a very useful table uh, showing how the data information, information management process effectively contribute uh, to developing, deploying, using and updating a digital twin uh, through, a, you know, through the use of technology, processes, practices, type of data, and in the context of the various uh, life uh, cycle stages. BIM is not a must have for all the digital twins in our you know, built environment, but it is, you know, it's an effective mechanism for creating an accurate and high value virtual representation. So organization with very good practice, um, being practices and efficient use, uh, usage of structured data and um, reasonably mature information, you know, management processes in place might have an easier, you know, time uh, to adopt uh, digital twins. And lastly, I would like to highlight in chapter four, um, a, a great table uh, presenting typical scenarios of digital twins and application from the design to the handover you know, phases based on the type of asset and use case. Um, use case. So certainly not an exhaustive you know, um, table, but a great starting point to help you to assess if a digital twin is useful or not. And, should we really consider a digital twin and what's the purpose? In fact, it is all about the business case and the use case that you're really trying you know, to address. 
When I get approached to help with the implementation of digital twins, sometimes it's buying these digital twins. Uh, the first thing I ask is, why do you want this digital representation of your asset? And what do you want to do with it? And I'm afraid to report, but often the answer is, I don't know. Um, the tender says so. Um, that's what my boss wants. That's what the executive wants. But actually, there's not really been so much, you know, um, thought put into asking the question why. So before you even start uh, to have to, you know, address, um, you know, you really need to start asking yourself why you want a digital twin, what type of digital twin, the use case you're trying to um, address, and how, you know, uh, you're going to do it. Um, then if you think uh, then the digital twin uh, can provide value and uh, which means it costs less than, uh, you know, and provide more value um, than what it costs, then definitely um, using digital twins uh, can help you answer a lot of your, your questions you might have. And uh, to describe this uh, important concept, um, I would like to use the metaphor of the elephant in the circus. So I like this metaphor, as I said, it's part of my article that you might want to read, you know, later on. So I describe it. So our asset data is the elephant in the room, right? That everybody's so uncomfortable to talk about. The circus ring is our construction life cycle. And then, as we say, during the life cycle, we exchange a very large amount of data. However, there is just only enough data that can be collected, creatively, created and maintained throughout the construction life cycle sustainably. Yeah? Producing just enough of what we need and structure it appropriately will underpin the successful creation, operations and more efficient use of what built assets throughout their life cycle. I strongly believe that the most challenging and fundamental task that we have to undertake as construction professionals, leveraging digital twins uh, for our big asset is keeping the weight off the elephant. And why this is important? Learning how to keep the weight off the elephant effectively represents the biggest opportunity to digitize and improve the most important industry at the base of our society. As a construction professionals, we have the duty of care to live a more efficient, productive and sustainable built environment to future generations. Access to structured data and consistent current and real-time asset information enable us to create digital twins which enable us to create smart cities, then ultimately allow the house to optimize operations and performance by continuous benchmarking. So ultimately, we're not only benefiting by improving the operations of our built asset overall, but also we can enable the virtuous circus to improve our society overall. So I'm afraid to report that so far, a lot, I've seen a lot more failures in implementation than successes. And unfortunately, the current trend I'm seeing is not about keeping the weight of the elephant, but actually is creating a digital representation of everything we know about the asset, not just about what is needed. Yeah. So completely missing to take in consideration that there is a massive cost you know, associated with creating and maintaining the digital representation, yeah? Digital twins needs to provide value. So the term digital twins means a lot of different things depending on where you are in the life cycle. So please be mindful on the who, the why, and the when. The, it's all about the business case and the, you know, and the use cases. Uh, the data is only as good as your process. And certainly the building information process can help you, you know, to streamline the digital, you know, information being exchanged. The CAPEX to OPEX handover means handling over data, yeah, 
So it becomes information and not only just the geometry, because I'm afraid, but a lot of the failures I've seen is just, you know, having just a lot of geometry that doesn't really provide you the extra information that you need, you know, to analyze. And ultimately, you know, the legal, you know, framework and procurement model is probably what I've seen uh, currently uh, the most, you know, amount of, you know, like point of failure. Uh, with a lot of these, uh, you know, this new digital twin, you know, tenders and requirements really asking for something that it's just not feasible, yeah, to deliver and just doesn't provide value and ultimately, you know, probably costs even more than the built asset itself, you know, to create. So, you know, just, um, you know, to finish, so wherever you are, you know, designer, contractor or operator, ultimately, I strongly believe that, you know, your competitive advantage is, you know, your asset take. So to summarize this, um, you know, brief presentation, having access to digital representation of a big asset can provide a huge amount of value. Um, we can't analyze the physical, but we can certainly analyze its digital representation seeking for insightful information to reduce in operating costs, optimize performance and sustainability, reduce rework, improve communications, which ultimately on a macro level, uh, translate into a better society, economy and environment. And uh, thank you for listening. Um, you can find me on uh, LinkedIn, on uh, Twitter, and on my website, where you find a lot of resources um, on, uh, you know, digital twins. And now uh, let's go and, uh, yeah, let's answer, answer your questions. Thank you for uh, listening. Thank you so much, Christina. I certainly found your presentation insightful, and it was an excellent overview of the digital twins landscape. As Christina mentioned, one of the key aspects of digital twins is the efficient and effective information management through ISO 19650. If you'd like to learn more about ISO 19650, our team's put together a guide of the series that distills the key concepts and principles of the standard throughout information management process. Well, that's it from us on this episode. If you want to catch up on anything you've missed today, I'll be sharing the recording of this webinar with you shortly. You can also catch up with previous sessions on the series on the 12D Synergy website. Lastly, I want to reach out and call all thought leaders. If you or a colleague have an innovative topic to share, we'd love to hear from you. So please get in touch through our email info at 12dsynergy.com. And thank you once again for joining us today. Stay tuned for more episodes in our Digital Engineering Thought Leaders series. Now, okay, hopefully you can hear me and yes, Let's start with some questions. <laughs> I will also say too that um, we'll follow this up with an email and we'll include details to the um, updated QR code as well. So nobody be too concerned that they're going to miss out on that. Um, let's get into these questions, I guess. We don't want to hold everyone up too long. So some of the good ones that came through were, what opportunities are there to increase the adoption of BIM and make digital twins more commonplace in the wider industry? Okay, so how do we make digital twin? I think it's the same question as how do we make BIM, you know, um, you know, why um why do you use, which as we know, uh has been for 15 years. And you know, say I spent, you know, nearly 15 years in uh, the UK and you know that's been you know something's been discussed for a, a very, very long time. And I think maybe just now is when finally we are start thinking about what um you know the the usefulness and you know what it, what are the benefits i think the opportunity that we have i think the digital twin is kind of like um a bit of a game changer in this regard and so maybe you know highlighting us and giving us the opportunity to uh assess uh the uh, uh the benefits yeah so as i said the concept is you know it, Technology advance, you know, advancement now allows us to create these digital, you know, representations and something, you know, in simple terms, some of them, like most of them, we've been doing this for a very long time. The difference that we have now is, and then is when you have a difference between a digital twin and a just simple digital representation, which is kind of static, is to make this, you know, uh, a twin in terms of making it alive, yeah, in terms of fidelity and synchronization, you know, of, um, you know, of, of the asset. So 
the, the, the reality, the, the concept, as I said, it's simple. We can't analyze the physical, we can analyze the digital, but why do we want to create a digital representation? Because there is one part of the assets that um, help us to know something and discover something uh, and improve our asset, yeah? whatever is the element of the asset. And then, of course, then the question you need to ask yourself, okay, I want to create this digital representation. Is, this, is there already digital? information being created and then is when most of them actually realized that a lot of this information was maybe created at some point and then it was not handed over you know to the asset operator or it's not in a format which is most of the time what uh, certainly um, the scenario I came across where it's just not uh, structured appropriately in the way that can be like reused and become meaningful so it's about you know setting up the strategy and uh <laughs> certainly the best advice of it is, is starting small uh, don't try uh to do uh too much um for the simple uh, fact that um it's um you need to see benefits yeah and often what i see is trying to do too much and they're trying to track everything too many elements with the results that you know there is a cost associated in uh, creating the digital representation and this you know coordination and as i said the elephant right so there's just only enough data that we that we can uh, collect analyze and you know a lot of these data that not actually produce value so we only really need to be able to collect and manage that elements that really makes the difference they give us more than what we know right now. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I so think this actually yeah, leads really so well. Yeah, the question of how we limited white is just uh, basically uh, discussing and uh, evaluating the business case and you know what's the use case, what do you want you know improve? In that case, then of course where the data comes from and then oh there is a big information modeling process that can help and it's already set up and there is standards for it. So. Perfect. Um, I was just going to say this probably leads really well into another question we've got here that says, okay. who pays for the transition of BIM to a digital twin? Well, this is the thing, as I say, it's the business case. Of course, you know, it's a, there are, if you're, if you're not too careful, the digital twin is going to cost you more than the asset. It's a fact. Yeah. Yeah. So who's going to pay? Oh, who's, there is someone paying, whereas the end users, you know, we're always paying. Uh, so um, it's um, we we you, you need to assess the value. I mean, the value is if you the creating those digital representation and uh, for the purpose of improving one asset, one aspect of the building gives you you know a big improvement that justifies its cost. Then you know you have automatically you know, uh, the business case, but it's um, for, uh, you know, for, for the transition. Um, but it's, you know, it needs to provide value. And unfortunately, sometimes what I see is like, oh, well, you know, it's creating this digital, you know, things for the sake of it, not really uh, thinking it through. Okay. So it all really comes down to the business case and making sure that you can cost, like justify the cost versus the, um, you know, the benefits that you'll see from the digital twin. And I think that's where a lot of projects come unstuck because it sounds really great in theory and, you know, the, what we see on the, the internet looks great, but it may not actually translate into the real world with regards to costs. Our life cycle is too fragmented, too long, with too far too many, you know, all of us just working, it's a small part of the puzzle. Right. So none of us has ever really thought it through as and also, you know, if you think about how we get, you know, trained, you know, as an architect, you know, particularly, you know, civil, you know, in, in all the industries as professionals, you don't, you know, you specialize in one part of the um the life cycle and you become very, very good at that, right? Where the digital twin, certainly when it comes to exchanging information and managing the information across the life cycle, it's kind of like you need to start this just no handover, you know, you need to Think about what comes next, and you know. So it it, is, it does require you know um, a you know fully uh, thought you know strategy for it. Yeah. Yep. So another really good question here around the cost benefits, I guess, is what are the main areas of payback with regards to a digital twin investment? The main area is anything that you can improve. 
you know if uh, if there is always one part i mean honestly why would you even start if there is you know if you're already happy right and the reality is i think one of the challenges is um you you can't improve everything but certainly there are some aspects whatever you're talking about the building and let's say you want to improve energy performance or let's talk about you know one of the probably one of the biggest opportunities we probably have in terms of sustainability you know um so you know as i mentioned uh, you know uh, europe is investing in heavily you know, in this digital you know building logbook with the purpose of you know we need to be able uh, to know um a lot more about our assets you know so what is the aspect we need to we don't know what we don't know currently right so we start collecting this information and we think once we have this information we know a lot more and of course there is always going to be more you know with purpose there's going to be more value provided you know uh, created than obviously what was um, consumed uh, so anything anytime it, it's as simple as you know it's like anything is it, it just the benefits in uh, um in in creating you know you, literally you can't create you can't analyze the physical so the only part you can analyze it's the, this digital representation and the, what you have now is the um very variety of you know hardware and software that allows you to do that we didn't have that you know a decade ago i think the most important question is we don't know what we're gonna have in 10 20 30 50 100 years and uh, some of our assets are going to you know be around for a very very long time so one of the biggest challenges i see um, certainly is from the procurement model uh when we start looking at um you know what is you know it's a digital i really see digital twin as an information management challenge right and but it's a challenge that needs to be supported by the technology um so we need software and we need you know hardware that we need you know technology providers that allow us to elaborate analyze and maintain and you know um and manage all of this you know information but we don't know what's going to be available in 50 100 years time and one of the probably one of the biggest benefits is being able to making sure we have a track record of all of this information so we need to be able to have an open you know uh, stand, certainly, I advocate for open standard approach to make sure uh, you can uh, um, read, you know, in the same way probably we read, you know, uh, formats uh, that are like, uh, you know, many, many years old. We can, we, we can see uh, and we can digest the information. Um, and uh, yeah, that is the, the value. Yeah. Yeah. We're seeing that a lot more too in like the smart technologies and smart cities that are coming through and and what councils are coming out of that sort of situation. So it's nice to see that step towards digital revolution with regards to our assets. Um, we have quite a lot of questions coming in. I'm not sure we're going to get to them all, but I will okay. try and cover the it's ones fine. that came through early on. I can try to answer the question. Is uh, It keeps popping up, so it's just too many to look at that. I'm just going to follow you. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I will lead the way. It's okay on that one. Um, so the next question we've got up here is, how is Digital Twin different from BIM? And is this just another buzzword? Yeah, so it's exactly what, you know, uh, I said, yes, certainly there is a lot of buzzword in right now, uh, especially when, uh, um, I mean, in the last um, three, four years, um, the amount of uh, people that approach me and say, I, I need a Digital Twin, and I can tell you there is nothing to do with it, like, for it, like, is not digital twin whatsoever it was not even a digital representation um so of course uh, unfortunately it's you know it's leveraged but, and unfortunately at the end of the day it just helps with you know spreading and advocating for it so uh i can't actually um say something bad about it but it's um it's it's making sure uh, you know it's yes there certainly is a new terminology that our industry is now witnessing, is mandated by government, especially heavily here in Australia, right? And uh, yeah, because there are there is benefits because you know we can do more with what we you know with the technology we have now. So why shouldn't we, right? At the end of the day, I think we're all happy to pay less taxes, right? And uh, we you know and to have in panel on our hand, you know, all our services, you know, and everything. And you know, just looking at, you know, as I say, I mean, you know, in uh, Melbourne, as I say I'm really new to obviously Australia only for the last few years and I'm not gonna start as I 
only right just for lockdowns but it's um you know certainly looks at um a bit of the you know digital victoria and everything but you know there is so much data already been produced and so much that can be done and at the moment it's just most of them is just a lot of different places and in a lot of different formats and cannot just be analyzed right so when you put everything all this information together then you know i think the opportunities are you know endless but unfortunately we also have a limited amount of resources so we can't just you know invest in everything right so we need to yeah. really assess the business case and as i say i always you know suggest if you're not sure just do um, something small, um, pilot, challenging, challenging when we're talking about, you know, digital twins with long-term value, try to analyze something after a very short time or something that you should actually assess in many, many, many years, challenging. Uh, but there are ways and proxies that you can use, you know, to do that. Um, but yeah, there is, um, it's, um, it's just a technology evolution. Yes, there is a definitely, um, you know, industry, but in the same way as BIM came to our world, uh, BIM allows us to structure the, the digital information appropriately, and the digital twin is kind of like our use case and, you know, of um, our aspect of the asset we want to improve. Yep. Um, another one that's really good that's come up a couple of times is, where do you think Australia is with regards to digital twin adoption? And does this vary across different user groups like developers, consultants, and contractors? So it's interesting because oh, I only know what I know, right? And <laughs> and I only spent a lot in uh, Europe, mostly the work with the UK, Middle East, and whatever, you know, approaches me. And uh, in Australia, it's, you know, it's, it's very, very, very new. I think certainly, the mandating, you know, seeing the strong position of the government um, in uh, embracing, you know, the opportunity. Uh, certainly, I think for many aspects, it's had. I mean, the UK has been, you know, has created these policies for it, for a national uh, digital twin, you know, connected digital twins um, for a long time. But at the same time, I've not seen, you know, any tender. Uh, or anything, yeah. any uptake, like on that regard, right? So certainly here, I certainly see a lot more. Um, I was at um, presenting and moderating a panel at the MCA a couple of weeks ago here, uh, you know, in Melbourne. So we discussed, obviously, discussed the topic and also, you know, what type of uptake, you know, um, that is different. I mean, you know, from obviously this entire supply chain. Certainly, probably I'm not the best to assess the Australian because I only really come from the outside. Um, I think the interest is there. I think it's just about um, probably overcoming, you know, the current challenges that not only Australia, but everyone else has, you know, in trying to, you know, improve this. As I said, I'm uh, chairing uh, um, at the digital, um, what big summit? I always said they're wrong. I ain't seen it a couple of weeks. So hopefully after that, I will also know everything about Australia. Um, um, but yes, I, I would say I'm a lot more, you know, definitely a lot I think it's a massive opportunity uh, for Australia to be ahead. Certainly. Yep. Absolutely. And I mean, there's lots of growth in this area, and you're obviously out here to um, to keep us all in know, I guess, and to give us a bit more advice coming from your background, which is great. But I will actually just note that we're running over time and we still have many, many questions. So what we might do is thank Christina very much for your time. And what we'll do, Christina, is we'll fold these questions on and we'll get some responses out to these attendees individually. Okay. So. Yes, perfect. And feel free to reach out to me. I mean, a lot of the answers <laughs> I usually post them <laughs> into the uh, quest in the somewhere else, my website, or you know, I'm very open on what happens i don't tend to hide because at the same time it also helps me to build my knowledge and expertise you know on the topic because if i know what the challenges are and you know as i say it's um if we want we can create the unicorns but we have to be you know um very aware and uh, very realistic about it <laughs> what can be done <laughs> so thank you very much for having me it was uh, an absolute pleasure
absolutely. Thank you for, for attending, I guess. And, and to the rest of our questionnaire guys that are still here, we will reach out to you all individually and um, we appreciate you attending today.